The Grumpy Gits return with more chaos, garnage and conversation. In this episode, we talk to Wrexham Football Club's Disability Liaison Officer, Kerry Evans, featuring the documentary, Welcome to Wrexham. Kerry talks about the changes she's been instrumental in making to create a truly inclusive space for all people, and what it's been like working with Rob McElhenney and Ryan Reynolds. The boys talk fashion. Yes, the world's least qualified fashion experts dig deep and get personal about fashion for middle-aged men and also for the disabled community. Trigger warning, there may be mullets. All this in our usual cacophony of BS and banter with See You Next Tuesday and of course our incredible partners Disability Expo. So find a comfy corner, sip a beverage and enter headfirst into the Grumpy Gits world. And remember, don't be grumpy alone. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever in the world you are watching this and welcome to another fun-packed edition of the Grumpy Gits. I am your glorious hoster with the most uh, Adam Pearson, leading you through the chaos, carnage and cavalcadery that this show has apparently become. I don't know, me either. Though I am not alone, oh no, I am joined by three titans of industry and disability who have accidentally become my friends. I didn't choose them, they chose me. Up first, hailing from sunny, sunny stone, the always smiling, always happy, he's been doing some gardening, Chris Lee Smith, your green fingered son of a gun, how's it going? You know that I'm in a mood, I don't know why you introduced me like that, that's ridiculous. I've, I, yeah, I've had a, a shitty few days, uh, I haven't had much sleep, but I didn't want to waste my intro on um, moaning, actually, I wanted your opinion, because I've... I've got the wife to book me in for an appointment. I'm thinking about getting my eyebrows done. What do you reckon? You mean like shredded? I think the term that she used is kind of microblading to make it slightly darker. Because if you look oh, at my yeah, eyebrows, like they only come to about yeah. here. No, no, go for it. Absolutely get your eyebrows done. If he gets that done, can you get his vagina done at the same time? <laughs> After beauty standards in men, and you make that comment, you hypocrite. <laughs> Yep, you're going to come out looking like Groucho Marx, and it's going to be glorious. Anyway, <laughs> how many power tools has your wife destroyed this week? I didn't really want to bring it up, because she's going to watch this episode. Hey. Potentially, potentially three. She she cut through the cord on the uh, hedge trimmer. This is the first time I'm going to get in trouble with my wife. <laughs> All the stuff I've said. So she, uh, she cut through the cord on the hedge trimmer. She burnt out the new mower, and also... I thought she destroyed the uh, pressure washer, but it turns out that it was the extension that blew. So, yeah, it was an expensive weekend. So your, your wife is to gardening what I am to MasterChef, is what we've learned this week. <laughs> she is to gardening what I am to mice. There we go. I want to bring us back to the eyebrow discussion just for a second. I want to know, do you get to determine which shape of eyebrow you get? Because I think this is vitally important, by the yes. way. Because... I'm all for it if you get eyebrows that make you look pissed off continuously. That's Chris's default. What I'm going to request is Ming the Merciless. That's that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go full on. Just, just as what, if Chris's wife is watching this, all I'll say is to get your revenge for the cord chat that we've just had, think Dennis the Menace. If you're going to do a pretend mock eyebrow on him, Dennis the oh, Menace. That's all I'm saying. Do it. Give him like a fucking Oasis monobrow. <laughs> <laughs> they do my head because much. I've got eyebrows all the way to here, and you can when I pick it, you can see my skin. But it looks like they come to about here, but they get really light. So I was like, "What do you reckon?" And she went, "Yeah, I think so." But I think she might have been in a mood as well because if I look like Joey from Friends afterwards, I'm never coming out of my house. I'm never filming. It will be just a blank screen with the you, microphone. That's you it. You will never look like Joy from Friends. Joy from Friends <laughs> was hot. And now that Chris has heinously dated both us and our podcast, <laughs> let's all move the hell on. He is the Scottish psychopath, the Big Mac Daddy. How are we doing, Martin? Where do you get these intros from? <laughs> I'm absolutely fine. I've never been called the Mac Daddy in my life. Mate, I, I spent a lot of time writing these. This doesn't just happen. 
I've had a tough day today, but I wasn't all right. But I wasn't. I'm fine now that you've called me the Mac Daddy. I'll, I'll take that, mate. I'm absolutely <laughs> fine. Thanks. I've been cheered up instantly by this conversation with Chris. <laughs> and I'm just having a, a good time, mate. I've had a I've had a funny day. I mentioned to you before that um, I play wheelchair rugby league. I played it again today. And actually, I got introduced properly, should I say, and I got absolutely taken out by one of my opponents today, like properly taken out. Two people had to aid me to back into my wheelchair because I get I get floored that heavily today. It was that bad of a tackle that it damaged the atmosphere for the rest of the game. Oh, it was, like, it was proper. Like what I'm hearing is your tackle's that bad it took out your wheelchair, and you're getting taken out by yeah. guys. <laughs> And that, my friend, was what I like to call money well spent. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm all right. Other than that, I'm absolutely fine. I'm still intact, still, in still can't walk. So we're all good. There we go. He's already disabled. What's the worst that can happen? It's and on good. that note, his countrymen put on an astonishing performance at Eurovision yesterday. Duncan Casman, you glorious mammal, how are you? I'm in much the same boat as the other two. I'm putting the grumpy and grumpy gigs this week. Kids, I swear, I spend my, my spare time searching on Amazon for time machines and condoms because fuck me. I just, <laughs> I'm out of this. <laughs> Hi, kids. If you're watching, time machines and condoms. Google it. I can, I can actually sense a see you next Tuesday question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is really old. I think it's French advert for condoms of a kid having a meltdown in a supermarket. Being like, I want yes. the condoms! Going, ah! The, the dad's being like, oh my god. And then it just says, use condoms. And I'm like, greatest advert ever. There was another one which was like advice on travel. And it's, for instance, do you know that if you go into Australia and ask for Durex, you'll get a well-known brand of sticky tape. And he's just got this guy's feet poking out of like a curtain as they're ripping off the <laughs> <laughs> talking about adverts. I was at a, a holiday in America one day and I was twelve. American adverts are so different to <laughs> UK ones are more conservative, right? And they're like, watching this advert in my hotel room and it's this old couple and they're dancing like this as if they've been cued to dance and they're like, Hey Dan, have you been using that hemorrhoid cream? And he was like, Yeah. And that was it. And I remember just sitting being like, what happened? <laughs> There's never been an ad for Android cream that is just a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know in the comments what your favourite advert of all time is. <laughs> and we, we might do a show where we take the top ten and yes. just review them. And on that note, now we're all introduced and we've shared our misery. <laughs> it is time for our regularly reoccurring opening segment I won't see you next Wednesday. Hell no. I'll see you one day earlier. I will see you next Tuesday. Insert <laughs> intro here. Let's go. Tuesday. I'll see you next Tuesday. And here it is, gentlemen, the uh, part of the show where we yell at each other, make fun of each other, though so it's all in love and somewhat good taste. Obviously not totally good taste, because people be people. Who would like to go first? Was there ever a point while you've owned a mobile phone that there was something on it that would have got you in deep trouble with your partner? I actually had this happen, not because of something I'd done. I left my phone on my desk at work, and this is before the days of really good security and stuff like that, and I hadn't even thought about it, and it was on at my desk. And I got home, and I'd shown Tracy a photo I'd taken on the, the phone. I was working in Bristol, and there was a guy on a tightrope outside the window and I'd taken a photo and she just flicked a couple back and there's some really dodgy pictures on there saved on my phone. Turns out my colleagues have got a hold of my phone and deliberately gone and searched a whole bunch of stuff, taken screenshots and just left them on there so that I'd stumble upon them later. Oh, uh, no, my wife was going to be the one to pick it up. Is it wrong to say I don't believe you? I don't have a company called Snowball. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a virus. He was a virus. <laughs> oh, no, I don't know what happened. Oh. It was them, but I'm sticking to that story for the sake of my marriage. Let's go with uh, Martin next. It's quite a similar. 
It's a similar story to Duncan's. You know those bastards on Newsround? You've seen it. Such a dodgy <laughs> lot, the BBC, aren't they? <laughs> BBC also stands for something else. <laughs> what does it stand for, Duncan? I don't know. I've heard rumours. <laughs> rumours. <laughs> You're not getting me into that conversation. <laughs> But this is my big worry, is it's not my relationship that I'm worried about, it's about never getting a job again. <laughs> you know We're mean? taking care not... of that on the Grumpy Geek. I'll, I'll be honest, Martin, you're fine. Look at the stuff <laughs> I've said on this show. I'm still working. You're not doing kids Happy shows. You're not doing yet. kids shows yet. What, you're expected to after what you've said on here? <laughs> Who knows? Um, if, we, if we look historically at the BBC, the bar for kids presenters has historically been set quite low. That's probably why I get a job in the first place, mate. <laughs> right, Martin, spill the this beans. What, what was on your phone? <laughs> I can't remember what age I was. I was in my late, sort of mid to late teens, and I, I, I took a picture of myself down, down there. Like, Can I ask, is it also like a sparrow? <laughs> it's not like a sparrow. That's why they call me a tripod. I'm only kidding. They don't call me a tripod. They've never called me that before in their life. <laughs> but... No, it's so so basically, I took a picture and it was an unfortunate angle. And basically, my mates got hold of it. Hold picture of it, or my phone and the picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, not the actual. Not the actual. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not the actual. That's for another day. Not the subject. <laughs> so my mate, my mate Kyle, who listens to this, he's like the instigator for this story every single time. Me and my mates all get together. Like you're talking about seventeen years ago, and Kyle still brings it up to this day. He says, he says that it looked like that. Like it was hooked. He was like, Martin, why does it look like that? It was just, that was like, it's not mine. I was like, it's not Matt, it's not mine. And they were like, well, whose is it then? <laughs> it's not mine. Like, I, could, I didn't know what to say, right? And I was like, it's, it's my brother John's. <laughs> it's like, my brother John's like six years younger than me. He was only like 11 or something at the time. And I was like, it's John's. It's John's, it's not mine. And I didn't know what to say. And I was like backed into a corner and I was like, ah! And I had to like reveal the fact that it was in fact mine. So we got a sparrow with a hooked penis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I, yeah, but the thing is, I'm never going to work in TV again. <laughs> I'm never going to work in telly again. But this is why I hate seeing you next Tuesday because it's <laughs> up every week. I think we've got a, a new nickname coming up Captain Hook. Yeah, Sparrow yeah. Hook. <laughs> Sparrow Hook. <laughs> Captain Jack Sparrow. So basically, like, Kyle will be listening to this and watching it next week, and he'll be like, I can't believe Martin's told that story. <laughs> I've got, I feel as though I've got to be true to myself as well. I'm, I'm getting to that age where I feel as though honesty is the best yeah. policy. It's all about dignity at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, my my eyebrow story doesn't seem so bad. <laughs> I'm hoping with some small mercy, right? I'm hoping... That Adam's going to get me out the shit here, yeah. so I'm going to just. <laughs> I'm, I'm good, nothing. That's I'm <laughs> um, so there, 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 there are uh, uh, two things here. One was something I did on a, a friend's phone, and this is when I was like 18, 19. It and again, like back before we didn't lock our phone in any meaningful way, we were in like a, a wedding spoon in, in the crocs, and we've been drinking. And this friend, who shall remain nameless, because to this day I still think he's undecided who did it, me. <laughs> he, I, don't, I don't know what he did exactly, I just know it wound me up. And so he went to the toilet, and I thought, okay, I need to make a point and put a line in the sand here that, that I am not he. And so I took his phone, and I texted his then girlfriend, saying, don't worry, She'll never find out. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Thinking that she would either know it was a joke or know it was me. Because at that point, she knew me rather well. The joke is I, like I, a I joke certainly at no point <laughs> that she would turn up to the pub we were in and say very loudly in front of a whole room full of people, what won't she find out, insert name here, what won't she fucking find out, <laughs> throw his drink at him, and leave. But with regards to my phone, I used to date a girl called Amanda, and she's never going to see this. She lives in Sweden. She probably forgets I exist, even though I used to rock her world. And she used to be in my phone as Mandy, 
because, you know, it was cute. And one time, I wrote a saucy message and sent it to what I thought was Mandy. Oh, so, yeah. being partially sighted, sometimes I click the wrong thing. And underneath the word Mandy in my phone book at the time was the word <laughs> Mum. <laughs> How how saucy was this message? It was pretty bad. Did did you explain what you were gonna do to Mandy? In great detail. Oh. <laughs> and your mum got it. This again, I'm gonna I'm gonna timestamp myself here. But you you three <coughs> all know what I'm talking about. This message was the equivalent of seven texts on a Nokia thirty two ten. A lot of detail. E. L. James would have read that text and gone steady on. <laughs> then I just get this reply back going, not meant for me. I hadn't realised until the next morning when I read the text from Mum and had to go downstairs for breakfast and go, Oh, hey. holy sh Oh my God. That's that moment where your heart stops for a minute and your spine goes cold. So when you went down for breakfast and your mum was there, don't say went down. <laughs> was in the text. Was in the text. Page so, three, I believe. So what was the conversation at breakfast that morning? My exact words were, hey, my bad. <laughs> Any chance we cannot talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Martin, you're safe. Oh, oh man, I don't know. What, I, think it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty close tie between me and Adam today. I think with him. Um... Mine follows on neatly from that. So I was recently reminded by my lovely wife of a very traumatic experience of uh, my parents at it. What was the worst moment you experienced with your your most awkward moment experienced with your parents? Okay, so I came home from college one day uh, as, as a young man, would, and I'm making small talk with my mum. And I used to have this thing where I try and shock my mum. <laughs> so um, she, she, she came home and... There, there, there were two instances of this happening. One time I, I came home, I said, oh, how's your day been? And she was like, oh, yeah, all good. I went to the doctors. I went, oh, the doctors? What kind of doctor? And then she didn't realise what's going on and tells me exactly what kind of doctor. Hips back, ankles up, we'll leave it there. And then I then go, oh, how'd that work out for you? She then throws me on the sofa, sits on me, and gives me a blow-by-blow blow account of exactly how it went. Did you and actually use blow-by-blow? Blow? Worst <laughs> word in. I, I, I am think, so scared. I, I am so I don't think I'm over it, lads. I don't think I'm over it. Esther Ranson would have had words. Oh, oh God. Chris. Anyway, Chris, get me the fuck out of this hole, please. Don't My say voice. that! <laughs> get me the fuck out of this hole. <laughs> I'm going to wake the oh. kids up. <laughs> Hi, Mum. If you want, she won't watch this. <laughs> I'm making sure she does. I think mine's quite common. I'm sure the movie's called Nine Millimeter or something like that. Have you heard of that? Eight Nine Millimeter. millimeter. Uh, Eight Millimeter. Uh, yes, that's K the one. Is, Sorry, is that not right, Martin Soto? That's typical, isn't it? He's, he's, you know, already, oh, it's nine millimetres, not eight. <laughs> I'm not sure that's something to boast about, eight or nine millimetres. That's... <laughs> and, and, and slightly curved. Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's quite a common one. You know, when you're sitting there with your parents and a scene comes on and you're like, this is so fucking awkward. And then it goes <laughs> on and on and on and you're like, ah, it's horrible. So, yeah, it's not too bad, mine, but yeah, certainly a common one. Martin, what about you? Oh, my mum and stepdad didn't care. Um, well, you were just sitting there and they would go at it. Go to your room, son. <laughs> Doesn't even go to your room. Very much, like, my, my, you might my, want to leave for this. <laughs> my, my just like, we had balls in our house growing up, man, and they just didn't give a shit who heard it. Like, they didn't care. <laughs> the point where they would just be like, no, well, they wouldn't even bat an eye either. The next day, uh, you know, seven minutes later, <laughs> they, would just, like, they would just be like, like uh, not as good as you. <laughs> <laughs> just like, yeah. It's like, see when you're brought up with like an older brother and a younger brother, three boys, and you've just got a mum and dad and you live in a tenement house in Glasgow, you don't get much privacy and it becomes desensitised. Like any any kind of 
problems you have with that, any kind of privacy is just out the window. We never had a big enough houses to to have that kind of privacy, to be honest. <laughs> they just went, fuck it, full caution to the wind. See, what's the worst that can happen to your kids when they can hear you having sex? <laughs> so, it explains a lot. <laughs> he's, uh, he's on the chopping block next. What three people in your phone book know too much and if they were to sell a story about you to a tabloid paper for money, what one are you most worried about being sold? I think I've just, I think I've just sold my own story on this podcast. <laughs> yes, are you following on from the conversation? <clears throat> it's basically exposed everything. I'm not going to tell the story of what they would sell to the media. There's no way I'm falling for that. <laughs> you know, mate, me neither, not a chance. I think all of my mates from Glasgow have... Anyone you knew from childhood is pretty much in that category. Yeah. Those awkward teen years where you made the mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, honestly, I don't, my pals in Glasgow would do it for free. They would, they would throw me under the bus for nothing, man. i got to agree with Martin. Mine wouldn't do it for money. <laughs> they would do it for the laugh. That's what they would do it for. They don't pay. <laughs> They would actually go, hey, look, I'll give you 50 quid if you can possibly print this. Because that's how liable works. Absolutely. <laughs> well, mine was a little bit of a, a little bit of a nod to Wrexham being on my show today. And I love superheroes. Ryan Reynolds is obviously owner of Wrexham now, Deadpool. So I was thinking to myself, and it fits in quite nicely with what's happened in this chat. Which superhero do you think would be the best shrink and why? Harley Quinn, because he's actually a psychiatrist. Oh, yeah. She's also cooked, mate. Cooked. Oh, yeah, but no one looks at the mantelpiece when you're poking the fireplace. I said to Amy, my, my partner earlier on, I asked her that question, and she just went, Wonder Woman. And I said, why? And she went, woman. And that's it. That's all I got. Smash that patriarchy, Amy. Smash that, it. That, that, <laughs> she's doing it for the girls. You can go Catwoman. Michelle Pfeiffer. I tell her anything. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, because Miss, Michelle Pfeiffer's got a whip. Among many other things. <laughs> I thought you hated cats. I do, and they need to be punished. Oh, God. <laughs> no. What's happening? That was horrible. <laughs> was so creepy. That was middle-aged creepy man. That, that character. <laughs> Never do that again. Oh, that was awful, Duncan. Oh, Leo Modell got cancelled for this. You know what you've done? You've just bummed, you've just bummed Chris's eyebrows off more. <laughs> Oh my god! I don't even know what to say to it. It's, it was vile. It's like secondhand embarrassment was so severe. It was it was horrible. I'm offended for you, Chris. That's how bad that was. Uh, I, I, there's two, and I can't decide between the two of them. Yeah. Professor X, because obviously with his mind control powers and everything else, um, and his wheelchair, and his wheelchair, yeah. And then you've got Scarecrow who I think is a psychologist as well, and isn't quite as crazy as Harley Quinn. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Let's, let's, let's all wait. You, you think Scarecrow, a man who's trying to cause all of Gotham to go into a psychosis, yep. so he could overthrow it with Ra's al Ghul, is less crazy than Harley Quinn? Oh, absolutely. Let's just park the bus. Right, this is coming for a guy who picked a woman who threw herself at a bath of acid for another man. Yes, and yes, yes. help Joker Ooh. blow up Metropolis with a nuke. Oh, excuse me for wanting a little bit of commitment from my psychiatrist. <laughs> we we could do this all night. We can bat think, back and forth. I I'm think fine. I, I'm fine. I think it's going to be the Dark Knight. I think it's going to be Batman. Yeah. Because he works best in the shadows. You've got to be in a dark, a nice dark, calm place. Bat cave seems like a decent place. It's a good environment in it. And in that voice, like, how are you? No, that kind of. All I'm hearing here is stalker. I don't feel that. I don't get it. No, I no, don't get you how don't. you think a dark, wet cave <laughs> is a comfortable environment, and a guy with that voice is—it's not soothing at all. But you picked a baldy guy who who kidnapped a school full of kids who's in a wheelchair and told them they had special powers when they don't. He had a nice <laughs> voice, and his house was nice. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of another thrilling. See you next Tuesday. Let's move on to a topic of discussion I'm very excited to talk about, gentlemen. So off the back of our last episode, talking about men's body image and what have you, 
I thought we'd delve into the, the world of fashion. A world I will happily admit, I know very little about. I've got no idea what's cool, what isn't cool. I spend my life in graphic tees and jeans. Because I don't have to do anything else. Where do we all stand? Are any of you dedicated followers of fashion? Oh, I'm with you. I mean, I'm wearing a t-shirt that you basically recommended, which is Iron Man, though. I don't think you're on trousers. I've only I, ever seen you in shorts. I have one pair, <laughs> and they're my smart trousers that I wore to the awards ceremony. <laughs> the only long pair of trousers I have. For me, I uh, I haven't got a clue what's going on. The last piece of fashion advice was from my son. He said, you're not taking me to school in those skinny jeans um, because you look ridiculous. <laughs> And nobody wears them anymore. I wear them. Well, he, he says they're out. And I, I can't find anybody else that wears them. So I was like, oh, well, that's a load of money that's wasted because I'm never wearing those again. Do you think you reach a certain age and your fashion sense freezes? No, because I don't ever remember being at kind of the forefront of fashion. When we kind of coming up with the idea to discuss this, I was thinking, all right, oh, in my early 20s, was I quite fashionable? And I was like, what was fashion back then? I have, I don't think I've ever known what fashion is. In my teens, it was heavy metal T-shirts and jeans. Um, well, I've, I've gone for the universal kind of look, like stuff that doesn't really go out of fashion, white tees or leather jackets or... You've just described Greece. Yeah, Greece looks good. <laughs> I, I, I like my, my jeans. I'll, I'll spend a, you know, a, a fair whack on, on a good pair of jeans. Yeah. Certainly because they'll last a while. And if you look at how much I wear them over how much they cost, in the long run, it works at maybe 8p a day for like a good pair of Levi's. And then shoes, I want to feel kind of comfy. If I'm going to be on my feet, it's rock and roll. But I want to spend, the, the max I'll spend on a pair of shoes is like 80 and then my T-shirts are like maybe nine quid a throw. You hit an age and it's like budget starts to come in over style. Back in my teens, it was all Nikes and whatever you had to look the part. There comes a point where you've got responsibility and it's like, I'm not spending fucking 90 quid in a pair of shoes. I'm just <laughs> thinking the sole of my trainers have started to come off a little bit. And, you know, back in my teens, I've been like, I need a new pet. I need a new pet. Yeah. I just got some super glue and just <laughs> put it back on. I was like, good as new. That'll do. <laughs> and now they squeak. Annoying, but <laughs> that attracts money. the mice. <laughs> 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 so this one permanently trapped in my shoe. It gets tortured every time I walk. I think that there's certain things when it comes to fashion that I will spend focus on and there's things that I don't care about so first of all being in a wheelchair actually is a very strange place to be when it comes to the fashion world because as you know I've got sparrow legs so like when you buy I wear trousers underneath my jeans if I wear jeans I wear like joggies underneath because if I just wear jeans on their own it, it makes my body look a little bit too proportionally unsound it's that old thing where if you think about you know, if you look at a top shop or a top man poster and the guy's wearing the shirt with the chinos or whatever or the jeans with a t-shirt and everything. But see, as soon as you sit down in a wheelchair with like a, a, a body that isn't that proportioned, everything looks different. Everything feels different. It's not as simple as that. When it comes to jeans and when it comes to t-shirts, I, I buy the cheapest t-shirts that I can find and they're always plain. But trainers, like things like trainers, I'll spend a lot of money on basically to seek out Air Jordans all the time because that's because I'm one of those people that once I find a brand that I like, I'm really clearly good. you need shoes that need a lot of wear. Never trust a man in a wheelchair with dirty shoes. <laughs> um, you don't ever see anybody wearing something how you sit. You know, it's really difficult to sort of gauge how something's going to look on you when you've got a disability of certain certain disabilities yeah. or how it or how it comes across. And plus, being in a wheelchair. But it is quite a dirty business. Your hands are constantly pushing wheels that have been on the ground and you're constantly like, like everybody does with their clothes, you touch them when you're doing things in the day, whether it's like, you know, wiping something down or just putting your hand on your jeans and things like that. So it's absolutely zero point for me spending money on expensive stuff all the time. There's nothing better than sort of, you know, getting some new new clobber, some new gear and, and thinking that you feel good in it. 
but it gets ruined in the wheelchair very quickly. So, yeah. There's an element there as well, I think, among guys, it's different. When I see a guy who's wearing all the latest fashion, so, you know, I, I had a friend here um, in town who he, he was all um, Dolce and & Gabbana and basically really high fashion stuff. And you kind of thought, kind of a bit of a wanker because he was constantly wearing just the ultimate high fashion stuff. And you, I think among guys, it's different to women. I think women wear clothes almost to impress each other. The, the, the theory is it's supposed to be impress the men, but actually they're impressing each other. Yeah, I think, guys, we don't give a crap. But also, I just think there are, there are people there that just get it. Do you know what I mean? They know what they fit, they know what suits them and they know what they look good in. Like my brother, John, John could literally put a bin bag on and he would look good in it. I mean, he's just got that posture about him and he's got, like, yeah. but he doesn't, you know, like, he knows how to coordinate his clothes right so that it all kind of fits. So you know what this is leading to, don't you? What? We've all got to go to see Trini and Susanna. Who do you think would benefit the most from a visit from the Queer Eye for the Straight Guy guys? guys Duncan. 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 Yeah. Duncan. Duncan. What, what do you think they would do to him? I think the first thing they do is shave my beard. Yeah, so oh, the yeah. thing is, I, I, I do, I look dude. like a fucking Cabbage Patch Kid. It looks ridiculous. I love it. It's adorable. <laughs> I think you should do it all the time. No, they, they shave him like an ape. Straight away. <laughs> do you know what I could see um, Duncan in though? Do you know what those sort of like white trousers sort of things? You know, like really fashionable white trousers with some like colourful socks. Oh, it's not like some kind of godfather coke dealer. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> fair. That's bit of that. I'm not saying a white suit. I said white trousers. Yeah, he, white trousers half and a, a plaid shirt suit. as well. He's I think that's what scarfing. they do. And a hat. <laughs> in a I've, um, hat. Confession: I've done white trousers. They stain easily. Yeah, I can see them. Know what the linen trousers with some flip flops? Do you know what I mean? With like a nice, nice floral shirt with like a big sun hat. <laughs> but isn't that the thing? Fat guys and Hawaiian shirts. Isn't that what happens? That's or they not... go for Homer Simpson and be like, "Yeah, here's a moo moo." <laughs> <laughs> if I if I save a town from a nuclear meltdown, I'll take that. <laughs> here's a question for you. If you've ever seen when you were growing up and that and you were um, sort of experimenting with fashions and stuff, was there ever a fashion or a sort of group that you wanted to be part of that you didn't have the guts? Uh, to- I'm going to confess here, and this is why I'm convinced why God has punished me to be bald. Mullet. Every Aussie in the planet at one yeah. point a mullet at one point. It, eh? was, it was the 80s. It was the era of Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, Metallica. Everyone had a fucking mullet. Yeah, I went through like a goth phase, just sort of like offspring hoodies and like skull jewelry. I think I had like black hair with red streaks in it and like guy liner. It was not a good moment. I looked like a really, really ill young blood. Um, me, I think it was the uh, Spliffy. You know the brand Spliffy. There was two. There was Spliffy, and I can't remember the other brand. One was expensive, and one was kind of a knockoff, and was like a cheaper version. And I, I'm sure it was Spliffy. It was very, very baggy. It was almost like skater clothes, but they did like bomber jackets and all this sort of stuff. And the brand itself, it was Is like that, yeah, yeah, I remember. Because you're not the kind of guy, Chris. So if you if you had your own clothing line, it'd A, be on Giacomo, and it'd be called something like Angry Parent. I don't know. I see Chris with his hair. I can see kind of a goth look because he looks like Dracula. I've never, <laughs> never, ever gone down that goth look. You'd rock a goth look. How okay. many goths do you know that are, are hyperactive, running all over the place and playing football? Oh, <laughs> I know many goths who spend a whole night at McDonald's eating everything on the menu. <laughs> Now because that I they can had a do. rough day in the garden. Yeah, <laughs> that that I can I can definitely achieve that. It's kind of a, a, a chameleon in school. I, I kind of got on with everybody, and it, there was never. I think it was just being pleasant and polite to everybody. So I want to come back to. I think genuinely, guys reach a point in their life, and it's like it's like a freeze frame. This is what I'm sticking with for the rest of my life. Yeah. yeah, I get confused afterwards. I remember a point, and I, I think it was around, I think it was around when I turned thirty, and then I was like, I'm so confused. And I think what plays a part in that is the fact that up until that age, and and I think it's slightly different for everybody, but around that, on average, you go out to social events more, and then you turn of an age, and then suddenly, 
95% of your time or higher is spent kind of at home. Yeah. Am fuck? I going to feel comfortable sitting on the couch watching Red Dwarf in this? Yeah. The <laughs> most change I went through in clothes was because I worked in an office. So I'd have hundreds of shirts, ties, trousers, all that sort of stuff. But as soon as I finished, I'd be in my pajamas. I can say I went through a weird thing where I remember someone saying to me in my like when I I think I was 18, it's like, oh, you don't want to be in heavy metal t-shirts and jeans the rest of your life. That would just be weird. And that launched me onto just basically <laughs> finding different shirts, different dress. And then when I hit 40, it was like, fuck it. And I went back to Eddie Middle to searching jeans, and I've been happy ever since. <laughs> Embracing the weird, man. Embrace the weird. Do you think we do enough to allow, and I'm going to aim this at you, Martin, in particular, do you think that the industry or, or fashion in general does enough to target itself towards disabled people and in particular people who have like different body types or who may be sitting down a lot more than their non-disabled counterparts do you yourself feel part of the wider fashion conversation no but that's because but i think that's partly on me as well so i, I should address that first is that i'm not somebody who actively seeks the latest of fashion trends anyway so maybe i've missed it but for me it's not like i ever walk into a shop or, or a clothing shop or whatever i never see a mannequin sitting in a wheelchair for example or even just a mannequin sitting down or a poster of someone who's sitting down or someone who's in a wheelchair in my position it's all right saying that you know um vogue have done some stuff with people with different disabilities because of representation and stuff but let's be honest right it's like look at these really high-end magazines like what british vogue you know that stuff but well, that's high-end that's like proper high-end fashion stuff that's not for your everyday people like us that's that's not what we're wearing the representation part's really good it's really nice to see someone with a disability on the cover of these big magazines because that's moving things along for representation but come on let's be honest where you really want to see these images um is in your high streets in your local high streets for your for your normal joe blogs like us to see it and and the short answer is definitely not so i would like to see it more in the high street and and see mannequins where young kids that are in wheelchairs or young kids with disabilities can see a mannequin and think oh that's how that will look on me there, there are people doing a lot of work in, in this space, people like Victoria Jenkins, who are taking the, the, the matter narrative and trying to like flip it on its head slightly and make the world of, of high street fashion way more inclusive for disabled people who, because of their disabilities, have different postures or, or body types or, or needs. And I think it's a really interesting thing to, to have to think about. If you spend most of your day sitting down you're, you're going to need a different set and a different cut and the pockets will need to be in different places and you'll need different functionality and it just goes to show that disability is something that you you don't get it till you get it yeah and it's so, one of those things as well if you look at accessible fashion now that's a different thing altogether when you look at fashion that is tailored for people with disabilities i've seen it before and that can be trainers that go over splints that people wear to straighten their feet out or whatever or that can be trousers that are button up trousers up the side so that people that have got lower and upper mobility issues can literally take off their trousers from the side and that happens that way but the thing is it's like that's nice the function of it is really good the function works but the aesthetics is rubbish. There's always a a, to a coin toss. Would you rather the function or would you rather look good? And why can't you have both? I think that's the key, isn't it? So much fashion is aimed at that design feature, if you like. It's It's got to look a certain way. But yeah, when you also, bring in even just general use, you look at that from the, you know, the distributor's perspective. You're having to wear things that are designed for people who've got use of their legs in every sense of the word why is it such a challenge to get something that would work for a person who's a wheelchair user to work in the everyday as well and we see it in other things where things that are aimed at disabled people become common use for everybody else you know electric can openers or anything mm -hmm. like that they take on this practicality that's like oh shit why did <coughs> that before doesn't it become extremely specialist when it comes to disability i do think it should change it and but from the other point of view, if you've got a company who's pumping out, for instance, say Primark or whatever, 
where they're pumping out shirt after shirt after shirt and your standard sizes of small, medium, large, extra large, and whatever <coughs> else comes after. But then you come across, say, someone who's physically disabled, a few stitches out, and it looks terrible. I'll come back at that with who here finds labels really annoying and irritating? Yeah, like a few shirts. Little like labels that, yeah. on, your, on your pants, on your shirts. All products made for autistic people. Well, Why do we have to have labels? Why can't they be printed on the back of a shirt? That's such an easy it. fix to do. Yeah, think, it's an easy fix, to be honest. I think you overcomplicate it. <laughs> Actually, everything, because there's nothing, if you want to look at both of the things that we've spoke about, really, when it comes to disability and fashion, like, all it would take is for the likes of Nike, Adidas, and all these people to put their heads together. They can do it for everything else and come up with fashion that works for everyone. And it would only take these these um, shops to put a mannequin that's sitting down in order to, to make a basic a basic representation of someone that's sitting well, down. Well, here's the thing. And we would... have virtual reality now. We've got augmented reality on our phones. Why aren't shops using that as something you can just go lift your phone up and here's what it will look like for you and you can select? Well, well actually, there's something called, there's something about that for blind people. So there is, Duncan, so they've got it already. So there's this, one of my mates who's blind has got this app in his phone that when he, if he goes like selfie mode in his phone, it will tell him what, what he's wearing, what brand it is and what colour it is so that he doesn't put two odd socks on. But well, this technology is already happening. It's just... That's it. Yeah, and it's already there. We have yeah. technology that can make fashion accessible for everyone, regardless. Why isn't that being utilised more? And welcome back to one of our patented Grumpy Gets People of Awesomeness interviews, where this week we sat down with the wonderful Terry Evans from Erection Football Club, recently purchased by Deadpool, I know, me too, to discuss what they're doing to help improve access and inclusivity at the football club for people with physical disabilities and those who also fall under the category of neurodivergent. So I, I gather you sat down and had a very good ching lag with her, Mr. Chris Lee Smith. We did, and um, I, I wanted to say one thing, and you'll see it in the interview. She had a lovely letter come through. I just want to emphasize what that means. And it's not taking it away from parents uh, with uh, neurotypical children, but certainly Duncan can attest to this. When she puts in the work and we get to enjoy something that isn't typical for us, it means everything. It means everything. Well, we've hung up enough. We don't want to tease you anymore. So here is the wonderful Kerry Evans. Take it away. After the past. Thank you very much, Adam. Yes, we're here with Kerry Evans, who's the Disability Liaison Officer at Wrexham Football Club. Kerry, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. I mean, let's be honest, you're, you're, you're having a good time at the moment, aren't you? It's been quite a season, yeah. Quite a season. Very, very, very special. We got our happy ending, so uh, onwards from here. Can I ask, because you were the uh, kind of a volunteer at Wrexham before it all changed. What's yeah. been the kind of main differences between your volunteer role and the official, uh, official disability liaison officer? The role itself hasn't progressed too much more, to be honest. I very much controlled that role as a as a volunteer and worked full time hours even when I was a volunteer. Obviously, there's always more of a workload. The difference from being fan owned with a board that all worked full time that that sort of looked after a football club in their their part time to now having Hollywood owners and the professionalism of the club is on a different scale. So tell us about that moment. So when Ryan and Rob came in and you heard that they were coming in to to take over the football club, tell us what your initial reactions were like and then just give us a summary of what life has been like under that ownership. To be honest, I got told one evening the names and myself and my husband didn't believe the names. We we were at home and we were like, no way. It all just seemed unreal. I then, by the next day, got contacted by a board member to ask, could my number be given to um, one of 
the prospective new owners. They wanted to speak to me. So, of course, I said yes, and then waited with anticipation for this call to come in, which came that that next night. My mobile phone rang and came up California, and I was like, wow, you know. So answered the phone, and it was Rob McElhenney. He, at that point, said that he'd spoken to the current board and the fan ownership and asked people that they needed to get on board to, to take over the club. My name and our president, Dixie McNeil's name, were mentioned. So he'd asked at that point, could he contact me and speak with me? And right from the off, he was so sincere. He was explaining what they wanted to do. He was explaining how important the job that I do and how they wanted to back. They wanted to help a community as well as help the club. And would I go on that journey with them? And of course, I jumped at the opportunity and said, yes, definitely, you've you've got me. We then Obviously, everybody who paid into the football club was an owner, myself included. So we had to do Zoom meetings because of because of the COVID pandemic. And they then did a, a Zoom meeting out to everyone who owned the football club to do a, what they wanted to do, what they wanted to achieve and, and sort of put, put their case forward. And in that meeting, I think my name was mentioned about five times. I kept getting contacted by my parents saying, they've mentioned you again. And they've it was all pretty special right from the off. It really was. And I'm honest enough to say, like everybody else, I did the why Wrexham. Why why Wrexham? What is this all about? Is this going to be what, what is being promised? And I've got to be honest, every single thing that they promised, they have already, and, and further, they've, they've fulfilled. Obviously, you had Rob and Ryan, and they've got their own huge reputation. And with that, uh, obviously, you've got the TV series and, you know, social media and, and everything that they've, they've brought forward. Do you feel like... Wrexham's rise and reputation has risen. Do you think it's been at the same level as disability awareness? Do you think that it's it's kind of not ridden the coattails, but as Wrexham have risen, do you think disability awareness has risen at the same time? I think so, yes. We're actually being told that we're setting standards at Wrexham. And I think that on the highlighting Ryan and Rob and what they bring, they automatically bring the awareness worldwide. I mean, I'm getting emails on a regular daily basis saying that people have, have so bought into what I've done at Wrexham for fans with disabilities. And so this isn't this isn't UK wide. This is worldwide that people are recognising what we do. It's been absolutely incredible. I do feel a pressure, even doing this now. We we had to have um, social media training because we were suddenly told, look, you know, you are representing Ryan and Rob at this football club. You know, they've got huge reputations that they really don't want, you know, spoiling. It is a pressure, a good pressure. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong. But I feel that you know, I hold that very special that I represent them at Wrexham Football Club and speak speak out. So the club have had to be careful. I think it now says we haven't got the owners with the most money, but we've certainly got the, the most famous owners throughout the whole pyramid of football. We talk about Ryan and Rob quite a lot, quite rightfully so, because it's a story in itself. But you, Kerry, are, are interesting because, you, as you say, Wrexham are setting the standards. People are saying when it comes to um, what happens with disability and how it's being run. Tell us just a little bit about your background with, with disability and Wrexham and, and what, what is your sort of plan going mm. forward and where do you where do you think about taking the club? Because I think what's important here is you actually telling your story as well. Just to go back to the, the very beginning, I, well, I was born um, with slight cerebral palsy that affected my right side, very weak down my right side, but I walked, I, I went to mainstream school. I then, unbeknownst to me, um, until it happened, I had, I, I turned 30, had a party and danced all night. I'd, I'd got married, I'd had a daughter and at age 30, I had a, a bleed on the brain that they said affected where had already been damaged by the cerebral palsy. So it completely paralysed me down the right side. It stopped internal organs on the right side of my body working. And it was just an overnight thing. It was 24 hours after this, I collapsed in the kitchen. I was told I'd never walk again. I'd be in a wheelchair. At that point, I worked full time. I was never, never involved with football. I'd always had an interest in football. My my brother used to play. We used to go to Wrexham with, with my dad and my brother. But that was where it ended. 
And then obviously I came out of work. My husband came out of work as my full-time carer. And for 10 years, we very much grieved for the carry that we'd lost because you're almost given this new person who's got a new lifestyle. And that was a 10-year period. We'd started going to Wrexham Games. My husband did the um, a radio show at Wrexham as a volunteer just to get out of the house. He's very much into radio. And he did a, a voluntary radio show all about Wrexham for seven years. I'd got involved from that point of view and I was going to games with my husband. We went to a, an away game. When we went to this away game, a guy came over and introduced himself in a manual wheelchair. He said, I'm Andy and I'm here to look after you if you need to know where the toilet is, if you need a blanket. He actually brought down cupcakes from the exec room at half time that had been left over. And I left there and said, wouldn't that be wonderful if every football club had an Andy? And unbeknownst to me, a few months later, Wrexham Football Club put out an advert for a disability liaison officer as a voluntary role. So I applied. Seven people were interviewed. I came out of the interview in tears and said, they've tied me in knots. I didn't know half the answers and I've just made an absolute fool of myself. And two days later, got a call to say, you were the outstanding candidate and you've got the job. <laughs> so... I know that's sort of gone off topic, your question, but that gives a bit of background on me. It hasn't, it hasn't gone off topic. It's actually better than what I had in my head, so you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Taking on that role, very naively and very stupidly now, I thought I'd been for an interview to be an Andy at Wrexham Football Club, to welcome guests, to make feel people feel welcome. And I felt I'd got a little bit to offer. I've got the gift of the gab. That would be something that would be for me to get, to get involved in. That was very much not what it was. The club themselves have actually said the, the, the role itself has grown enormous. But the club themselves say, I've been the person who's driven that. I think potentially if you had had somebody else in that role, I'm not saying it would have been the Andy just on a match day. It may have been other elements, but I don't know whether it would be as big as the role now is that I do. I've driven that role. The more that, obviously, you know yourself, Martin, being a wheelchair user, my comfort zone was was I was a wheelchair user. I knew what wheelchair users needed. I knew what would make a difference. And that was where I started. That was where I my comfort zone was. I ordered in ponchos so that we could offer out ponchos in the wet weather. I bought in blankets to offer out because of Andy. We started doing access, wheelchair accessible away travel. We were the only club in our league and a league above, as far as I'm aware, that was suddenly offering wheelchair users to go to away games because I felt that was really important in this day and age that everybody got the same opportunity and then it grew because then you start to realize that you're doing a good job you're getting a lot of plaudits from that job because people are saying you're changing our lives this is wonderful we'd had grown men in tears suddenly being able to go away to away games and you suddenly start to think there's a lot of people I could be helping here. There's hidden disabilities. There's there's so many more elements. And that's when I started to move my focus to what else can we do? Prior to me being at the club, there'd been we've got a, a disabled supporters association and they'd been involved with doing a, an autism friendly match. And apparently it was the first one ever done in, in the UK. But straight away, I was like, well, hang on what was put in place and what why was this one match why why we need we need to be offering and offering a service so that these families can come in every single game of the season so i met up with the national autistic society i had a pad of lists of things that i knew we could easily put in place and to be fair straight away the lady that i met kerry roberts said you bang on point what you're saying you can offer is all we would ask so very quickly we grew to the club were very accommodating and gave me an area. I think I've got 160 seats, which we called our quiet zone. We set up a, a sensory hub at the back of that area so that people had got a sensory room to go into as and when they needed. And we had an accessible toilet that was in a quieter area right at the, at the side of the, the sensory room. So it was all very compact. We had one lone family. I did a, I, I now do regular, I do quiet walkabout sessions. We advertise and we have families that come in when the stadium is closed. 
I meet them and show them where they can park. I meet them and show them an accessible entrance because we don't expect people with autism to go through turnstiles. We have a, a double doorway entrance, a quieter route that was important because they don't want to be going through a concourse with 500 fans. And then when you get there, we've got familiar face accessible stewards that are all trained. They work every single match day. So they've become family friends. They're familiar to every, the children all feel they know them and get hugs and, you know, they're excited to go and see them. And we offer out things like we do, we offer out sensory bags that they can loan for the day. We offer out weighted teddies. In fact, we had one of those and he was so popular. We now have three weighted blankets. All the things in the sensory room have been researched and are all um, calming. In the sensory room, we now have a TV that's familiarisation that does the route from the car park to where the route they take and where they sit. All the staff that are involved within the quiet zone, we do um, a picture and all where positions of players, because again, it's F the the key is familiarization with these families so by learning where the players play learning about the players it's all so important and then we um started up a waitress service because then we were like well these people can't leave their children or their children can't go and queue to go and buy their refreshments at half time so we've now got a full setup that we take a waitress service they fill it in the week prior to the game they're coming to everything is then paid for and everything comes out before half time on a match day if somebody doesn't attend then we can refund them the following week we've put a lot of work into that and that now runs like clockwork we have permission that people can stay in their seats there 10 minutes after the game so that they don't have to be going out with all the all the crowds wheelchair accessible away travel was outstanding because that had literally people who'd been lifelong fans of the club that had never ever been to an away game suddenly could access away away games and that's very special but probably my greatest the thing that i will if i finish my job today <laughs> to be remembered for i think will be the quiet zone and how we've we've enabled families who have readily said they gen they genuinely could not come to Wrexham Football Club and sit in the crowds with the fans if this area wasn't available they couldn't attend. I'm speechless. Yeah, <laughs> I was just about to ask you, Chris. I was just about to say, Chris, what do you think about that? <laughs> I'm going to be honest, if I was a wheelchair user, if I was disabled and if I wasn't, if somebody had offered me a package where I could go and watch football and get my food brought to me, I'd be up. If somebody could bring me my pie and bovro to me when I'm watching football, I'll be absolutely delighted. But well, well just... you could at Wrexham because we offer that service to our wheelchair users as well. Yeah. Wheelchair users in our quiet zone all get the option of the waitress service. But what a difference that makes, you know, that someone is focusing on that and they aren't, it isn't just kind of a part-time person that has kind of glance an eye over it and go well maybe we could do these couple of things and then leaving it and doing other jobs this is mm -hmm. someone that's dedicated to the role that has gone right from the beginning for the ideas and researched and looked on what disabled people need and they've gone right through the journey until it's come to its end it's I, probably the same everywhere it isn't um i won't tell you the club um but i actually had a meeting on friday with a championship club we did a zoom meeting and they've been sent in my direction because they're wanting to set up a quiet zone and a sensory hub within a championship club. Oh, that proves that. how it's not readily available everywhere. I feel it's so important. I mean, we had, we had, we've had families that have come into that quiet zone that have actually said to me, I'm not a football fan. We don't like football, but you've created something that we can come to as a family that we don't have to feel worried what might happen while we're here. We know that we'll have help. Our children are off Xboxes. They're getting fresh air and it's something we can do as a family. Now, those, that particular family I've got in my head, as I'm telling you, are now been there three years, got all the shirts, got all the scarves, and are now massive football fans. But the point is, it's bringing in people that weren't even football fans, but because of what we've created, they feel that they want to attend as a family. I'm a bit of a romantic when it comes to stories, right? That's I think that's why I, I do my job quite well. So if, if I'm listening back to your story, I don't believe in mistakes sometimes. <laughs> I don't believe that things happen by accident. I've got cerebral palsy as well, so I know what that's like. When you think back, it's quite hard not to get romantic about your story and not to feel like 
you know, the right person is stepping in at the right time. I'm 47 now and people say, oh, you know, it's awful what's happened to you being in being a wheelchair user and what happened at 30. And I turn it to a positive. I'd have never had this football life having this not happen. I wouldn't have been in this world. To have had the opportunity I I that sort of brought itself forward ten years into into my journey of becoming a wheelchair user and let's be honest, never feeling that I'd ever have anything to give in the working world again. I thought that I would just now be, you know, a disabled person. We'd unfortunately we'd have to go onto the benefit system. If somebody had have said to me at age thirty this is what's going to happen to you in the next 17 years. I would have laughed them out the place. I mean, it's just it's just what dreams are made of. I say to a lot to a lot of people, Wrexham Football Club took took a chance on me. They gave me the opportunity to prove myself. I didn't know whether I could do this. I I know now I can do this, and I'm absolutely thriving and loving it. But I didn't know I could do it, and I think that they gave me an opportunity that I owe them a lot. They gave me a reason to get back up, get back up each day and to tax myself and, you know, to have something to get up for. If I can do this, anybody can do. You've just got to find what you're good at. You've really got to. Everybody is good at something and you've got to find your niche. And if somebody had said to me, age 29, 30, prior to this, your, your niche is going to be in, in a football club, I would have said not on your life. It's really hard not to get romantic about your story, Kerry, but I just want to say on behalf of the the Grumpy Gits, uh, thanks very much for talking to us. It's been a real pleasure. You're very welcome. No worries, thank you. I'm going to throw back to Adam now because I'm going to go and have a cry. (laughs) (laughs) Take care. Over now to our good friends at the Disability Expo. They've sponsored the show for a while now. We love it a bit. We enjoy working with them. It's coming up on the 6th and 7th of July and this week we're talking about the Disability Marketplace. It's a a, um, trading platform for smaller companies who otherwise might not get the space or the headlines that they rightly deserve for things that could help benefit the everyday lives of people from the disabled community. So take it away, Disability Expo. Disability Expo is a truly community-focused event, placing the individual and their needs at the centre of everything that we do. In our Exhibition Hall and Marketplace, you will discover the latest developments supporting the disabled community, as well as services and information to help improve accessibility, promote inclusion, support independent living, and increase independence. Our exhibitors will showcase innovations in mobility, independent living, and assistive technology. Identify the products and services most suited to your individual needs by seeing, feeling and trying out multiple options under one roof. With information on routes to funding available too, it is a one-stop shop. Other sectors represented in our exhibition space include employment, education, care, insurance, fashion, travel and holidays and so much more. Smaller and affordable practical items can be purchased from the marketplace. Improve your daily living, your well-being offer comfort and even style. A variety of charitable organisations will also promote their vital services and give impartial advice around their areas of expertise. So join us at Disability Expo this July. Visit www.thedisabilityexpo.com to register for your free ticket now. Gentlemen, are there any products or little things that you use on a day-to-day basis that on the face of it seem really innocuous but can have trends on your lives immeasurably? I can say for my daughter, something we use regularly is it's actually just it's a teddy bear blanket. So when I say teddy bear blanket, it's for people to understand, it's basically a blanket that is made of teddy bear fur. So the kind of soft plush fur that you find on a, a teddy bear is made in a, into a blanket or a duvet cover. She uses that all the time. And it's something that you won't get in the, you know, the, the wider, you know, big business side of things. Something that smaller companies provide that she really values. 
and there are weighted blankets and there are sort of fidget toys and stuff like that and things that are made that people you know we've we've done exhibitions before and we've seen the amazing stuff people do with like walking sticks making it so it's kind of let more than just you know just a standard piece of wood on a hook whatever kind of thing where it's really making a statement and it's that kind of business that really comes into the marketplace and i think that's brilliant yeah because you had guys on the floor like koala who do the um prosthetics made of fabric yeah. that are, that are lighter and more transportable also for young children you've mentioned sort of like walking sticks and mobility aids an area where people like lucy dawson are, are really really excelling so i think it's something that's really overlooked and underappreciated and unless you have like tens of thousands behind you to start marketing you can very often go ignored or, or lost in the shuffle and if you can't find the audience you saw cost for acquisition costs are like just too high it becomes the cyclical problem of no supply so no demand and the more people that know about these companies the better it is for the community as a whole because very often these companies have been set up by disabled people for disabled people so i'm really right excited example. for the marketplace so there we are go if you're there on the 6th and the 7th of july go check out the marketplace at the expo excel center london um we'll be there i won't buy or anything but i'll say hey and <laughs> yeah go go check it out it's gonna be epic and on that bombshell gentlemen all that's left to do is say thank you for joining me and and experiencing another episode of the grumpy gets it is always an honor and a privilege to spend my let's give it away sunday evenings with you this is genuinely one of the highlights of my fortnight chris lee smith if people want to know more about you and see you shouting to the void online how can they do so and where can they go so i'm on twitter and i'm on instagram and it's at the real grump dad and Duncan Carson, if people want to know more about you or the other work you do with your YouTube channel, PDA Dad, how can they do so? At PDA Dad UK uh, on pretty much any social media platform. And Mr. Martin Dugan, should people want to know more about you or find you on that there interwebs, how can they do so? They can get me on Twitter at Marty with an I, Dugan2012, and on Instagram, I'm Martin Dugan11. And you can find me on Twitter at Adam underscore Pearson and Instagram at Adam underscore Pearson underscore TV because I'm famous and flexing. If you liked what you've seen today, hit that like, smash that subscribe, comment down below, favourite adverts, wait to your friends and most like to screw you over what's on your phone that shouldn't be on your phone. We'd absolutely love to hear from you. So... From me, Adam Pearson, from him, Martin Dugan, from him, Duncan Casburn, and from him, Chris Lee Smith. Thank you all for joining us. Take care. Mwah. We love you. See you next time. And as always, don't be grumpy alone. <laughs>